probably noticed that our most popular video here on the Dice Breaker YouTube channel, by the way, if you haven't already, please hit that subscribe button right now. Thank you kindly, it does really help. Anyway, the most popular video by far here on our channel is ex-member Johnny's 10 game list of TTRPGs that aren't D&D. Featuring a little cameo from yours truly. It's a recommendation that a lot of people are constantly interested in hearing about because despite its dominance, the Dragon game definitely isn't everyone's cup of tea. And sometimes you want to shake things up a little. Well, according to my invisible watch here, uh, it's been like two years now since that video went up. Jesus Christ. Will the universe please just stop for a second? So we thought it was high time we put together a little follow-up video with some more recommendations from the team. So with that in mind, strap yourself in, hit that like button, and let's talk about six more TTRPGs that aren't Dungeons & Dragons. Number one, Lasers & Phoenix. Okay, so B-roll is gonna be a bit of an issue on this one because the entirety of this game's rules are placed on a single sheet of paper. I'm conscious that when we do these big lists of recommendations, a lot of the games can be quite dense and rules heavy affairs that demand a lot of preparation and attention from you all when you try to sit down and play them. So with that in mind, this is the other most famous TTRPG by John Harper, Lasers and Feelings. Mechanically, as you can probably guess, this game is a breeze. Character creation is as simple as answering a few questions and then assigning yourself a single number on a D6. You have two stats, lasers and feelings. You roll with lasers when you do something cold or calculated, or maybe something that requires technical knowledge and know-how, or the ability to stay calm. To succeed at a lasers roll, you have to roll under the number that you selected in character creation. Conversely, you roll with feelings when you want to do something passionate and intuitive. Maybe take part in diplomacy or a daring feat, or even just rely on your gut feelings. To succeed at a feelings roll, you have to roll over your number instead. You always start with 1d6 every time you do something risky, and you'll add more on top if you're prepared or you're an expert at what you're attempting to do. You can even help another player to give them an extra die as well. The only other rule you need to know to play is that by rolling the exact number that you selected for your character during any roll you perform, you have laser, laser feelings, feelings, which allows you to ask the GM a question that they honestly answer. And that's it. That's all the rules. There's a couple roll tables to generate adventures, some GM advice, and that's literally all you need to play. And it's great. It's inspired a whole host of RPGs and even a meme in the form of the you have two stats with similar games like Honey Heist. Not to mention the fact that whilst the original is very much Star Trek adjacent in its themes, as with most of the games Harper has put out, Lasers and Feelings is under a Creative Commons license and can be hacked, remixed however you see fit. There's a huge amount of user-generated Lasers and Feelings hacks in all sorts of themes, so if retro sci-fi isn't your bag, don't worry, there's loads to pick from and they all work in the same way. The main thing though, this is literally one of the easiest TTRPG rule sets in the business, and there's not many people out there that would struggle to pick it up, even if they're new to the hobby. If you want a really good introduction to what role-playing is and how it works with minimal investment, then this is absolutely the game or system for you. Number two, Vampire the Masquerade. If you ever watched the 1987 classic The Lost Boys, starring a pre-24 era Kiefer Sutherland, then you already know everything you need to know about Vampire the Masquerade 5th Edition. Vampire isn't your grandma's role-playing game. It's a dark and sexy RPG about rival gangs of blood snuggers sneaking around the filthy streets of LA in search of purpose in their otherwise utterly lonely and miserable lives. It may be an extremely stylish role-playing game. The 5th edition rulebook looks like a model catalogue produced by 80 synth emo band The Cure, but Vampire is fundamentally a study of tragedy. People in Vampire are turned or embraced into, well, vampires whenever they are attacked by a member of the Kindred, the person who survives on the blood of human beings. The Kindred are said to be descendants of Cain, that bad guy who betrayed Abel back in the Bible, who have been cursed with the desire for blood drinking, but blessed with all manner of incredible supernatural abilities. Depending on which kind of kindred turned them, the player character in Vampire will be part of a different clan and will have access to different powers. For example, the Ventru are natural leaders whom others are compelled to follow, the Toreador are incredibly charismatic, the 
Tremere clan are gifted with spellcasting and the Bruvia with strength. Some clans have it easier than others. The Malkavian are haunted by their abilities of foresight, which have unfortunately been attached to some disappointing perceptions on mental illness in Vampire's past, whilst the Nosferatu can't even walk on the streets because of their hideous appearance. Regardless of which clan the player characters are a part of, they must all abide by one simple rule. Do not break the masquerade. See, humanity doesn't yet openly know that vampires actually exist, and the kindred want to keep it that way. It's just like Twilight. Keep the whole vampire thing under wraps and pale face Michael Sheen won't come after you. Sort of. How you choose to live your undead life is up to you. Murder, crime, love, redemption. It's there for the taking, but ultimately, how much of your humanity will be left after it all ends? Number three, Lancer. It's 13,000 years in the future and the universe is on its way to a post-scarcity utopia. But the dream is still very much a work in progress and on the fringes of civilization, there are still battles to be fought, lives to be saved and problems to be solved. You and your crew are Lancers, members of the cavalry called into the parts of the universe that need you most to help or sometimes hinder the worlds and stations you visit. Now, whilst you're more than capable of helping out those afflicted on foot, not to mention the state-of-the-art tech and weapons that you're equipped with on your journey, the real draw of Lancer is in fact the giant stompy mechas that you all individually pilot. Lancer at its core is a fusion of two different styles of play, the very rules light and free-flowing on-foot adventures of your pilots, and the hyper-tactical turn-based battles you'll be fighting in in your mechs. I think Lancer would be a perfect entry for someone who plays a lot of miniatures games like Battletech or even Warhammer. The turn-based hex grid tactical squad level combat is really juicy and there's a huge amount of customization to flesh out your gear. Character advancement in Lancer allows your pilot to pick up new licenses which opens the door to an unlimited amount of tech from the relevant company. Whilst you start with a single crappy mech, you'll slowly unlock huge rosters of frames and all sorts of goodies to strap onto its arms and melt your foes with. There's big chunky boys, super speed boys, weird alien boys, you name it. And feel free to mix and match as well. Combining frames from one company and weapons from another can create some interesting and deadly combos. You just have to make sure you've got the space and power for them. Outside the mechas, handling challenges is as easy as rolling a d20. In lieu of skills and abilities, you'll instead have a simple tag system that lets you up your results based on their relevance. Say you've got a tag by the name of Quick Hands. That might be useful for some sneaky pickpocketing, but it can also serve you to help you swing through your opponent's guard in a fist fight, for example. The world of Lancer is one that doesn't rest on tired tropes. I mentioned Warhammer earlier, but don't expect any of the same grim, dark, nihilistic world building that you'd see in 40k. This isn't a perfect world that you're inhabiting in Lancer. I mean, if it was, it'd be a pretty boring thing to pilot war mechs in. No, the universe definitely still has its problems, but in the world of Lancer, there is definitely hope. Something that, if you choose to, you can embody in your time as one of its cavalry. Number four, Bluebeard's Bride. The tale of Bluebeard is one that's been passed down for generations. It's a cautionary one designed to warn impressionable young women against indulging in their curiosity and going against the wishes of those who know better. Ugh. It has been since reinvented in a multitude of different ways, including an excellent version written by feminist author Angela Carter called The Bloody Chamber, with one of those reinventions being a tabletop role-playing game called Bluebeard's Bride. For those of you who may not be familiar with the tale, Bluebeard's Bride is a story about a young woman who is married to a rich man who happens to both have a blue coloured beard and been already married multiple times, with all of his previous wives having mysteriously disappeared, which is frankly a pretty big red flag right there. The newly married woman is left alone in Bluebeard's house and is told she's allowed to go anywhere except for a single locked room. Of course, the young woman eventually goes into that room and discovers something terrible before she's gruesomely murdered by her husband. Bluebeard's Bride the RPG has players working together to guide the young bride through the mansion that she finds herself in, deciding whether she remains loyal to her husband or if she fights against his oppression. Each player commands a different voice of influence, with the game shifting between the various influences as they vie for control over the bride. Bluebeard's Bride is both an investigative role-playing game with the players 
pulling the bride through the mansion's different rooms in search of the truth about her husband, and an exercise in collaborative storytelling. Each of the different influences will have their own approach to dealing with a situation. For example, the, the mother, an assertive and protective presence, may encourage the bride to stand up for herself, whilst the virgin's innocence will make it harder for her to take a stand, but easier for her to trust in others. Blending these vastly different perspectives together is undoubtedly a challenge, but unless the players learn to hear each other out, then the bride is doomed to wander Bluebeard's halls forever. A fascinating and experimental experience, Bluebeard's Bride is definitely an RPG that's worth playing, especially for fans of things like Disco Elysium, and I mean, who isn't a fan of that? Number five, Mouse Ritter. Battling beholders, mind flayers, and owlbears as a party of elves, orcs, and dwarves in Dungeons and Dragons can be pretty tense, but do you know what would make things even more exciting? That's right, if you were a tiny mouse. Following in the vein of books like Redwall, The Rescuers, and Board Game Mice and Mystics, Mouse Ritter six players in the teeny paws of mouse heroes who venture out on a big journey, made even bigger by the fact that they're, you know, literal mice. Despite being a modern RPG from creator Isaac Williams, first released only a couple of years ago, Mouse Ritter has a retro feel that will be familiar to anyone who's played older editions of D&D and other old school renaissance RPGs. It's built on the rules light -like system used in fellow OSR game Into the Odd, with players rolling a single d20 against just three main traits, strength, dex, and will. Even inventory management is fast and <gasps> actually fun as players equip weapons, gear, and items by slotting physical cards into the squares on their character sheet. No need to fiddle with encumbrance or counting individual arrows. If you have space for something, then you can carry it. Mouse Ritter's beginner-friendly gameplay alone makes it worth playing, but its world is also full of charm. As players explore forests, fields, and places with names like Stumpsville, which is very cute, from a mouse's eye view. Forget having to go OTT with a dragon, even big bugs and other animals can pose massive threats to the party of brave rodents. As well as weapons ranging from simple sticks and stones to swords and bows, the mice have magic at their disposal. Magic in Mouse Ritter is one of the game's highlights, requiring characters to perform unique and inventive rituals to recharge the powerful spells. You might have to give a cat a gift it truly desires for an alluring dose of catnip, or even drop from a height of at least 30 feet to regain your magic missile. Helping players and GMs along are the rulebook's many tables of ideas, which are filled with fun and imaginative starting points for characters, NPCs, places, and adventures. You could be picking your way through a cow skeleton as a hedge witch and bat cultist one session, fleeing an owl as your noble mouse escapes a cat lord's castle the next. Mouse Ritter's website even has an instant mouse generator, which should absolutely be tried out if you haven't already, if the idea of playing Myrtle Ratchlap Fungus Farmer and Sassafras Danger the Worm Rider is as exciting for you as it is for us. Experiencing the everyday as a mouse makes Mouse Ritter campaigns feel brilliantly fantastical and perfect for players looking for something different from classic D&D fantasy or high-tech sci-fi. While the life of a mouse can be fraught with danger, the animal characters and friendly rules means that Mouse Ritter can easily be run for younger players as well as older ones. Mouse Ritter is a standout tabletop RPG from the last few years, the old school feel of a classic wrapped in the approachability and ease of a modern release, paired with a premise that will keep your band of hardy mouseketeers playing for hours. All this and the book is stunning to look at too, so make sure you ro don't ro ro don't miss ro don't miss out. Sorry. Number six, RuneQuest. RuneQuest has been around almost as long as Dungeons and Dragons. Originally releasing in 1978, only a handful of years after D&D's first edition hit tables. Over the decades, Greg Stafford and Steve Perrin's influential role-playing game of gods, myth, and fantasy hasn't seen quite the same explosion in mainstream popularity as D&D, but it still has a committed following of fans who have fallen for the RPG's unique blend of realism, magic, and mysticism. If you've not come across it before, it's a classic worth seeking out. RuneQuest grew out of Stafford's fantasy world of Glorantha, which started life in short stories and board games before serving as the setting for the RPG. 
The world steeped in deep mythology and lore was combined with Perrin's innovative gameplay ideas, which brought a much more realistic feel to combat inspired by medieval recreation groups and a new way of progressing characters that stood apart from D&D. During battle, players could target specific body parts and track locational damage to weapons and armor, making it a closer simulation of real-life sword fighting than the generalized HP system of D&D. Characters also advanced based on their specific skills rather than their fixed class, making it easier to specialize and make your character distinct from all the others. Instead of D&D's iconic D20, RuneQuest uses a D100 system. Players roll two 10-sided dice, hoping to roll under and not over their character's trait, is a given skill. The percentage-based system would later become known as the basic role-playing system, powering other hit games such as the seminal horror RPG Call of Cthulhu. Like D&D, RuneQuest has seen a number of additions over the years. Its latest evolution is 2018's RuneQuest Role-Playing in Glorantha, released exactly 40 years after the RPG's first edition. Drawing from the beloved 1982nd edition of the game, but expanded and refined with ideas borrowed from Stafford's cult masterpiece, King Arthur Pendragon, role-playing in Garantha, retained the complexity and depth that first made RuneQuest a close rival to D&D, but updated for a new generation of players to discover. Both Stafford and Perrin have passed away in recent years, following the release of RuneQuest's latest edition, but the game continues to stand up as a singular in fantasy role-playing. A mix of visionary world building and ambitious gameplay that offers something very different to the likes of Dungeons and Dragons. A powerful meeting of realism with fantasy. It's a tabletop RPG that has remained a cult classic for decades. It may not be as well known as Dungeons and Dragons, but it deserves to be discovered by more players. And that you can take as a fact. Well, there you have it. Six more TT RPGs to sink your teeth into if you're looking for something to replace the big dragon for your next session with friends. And let me just tell you now, if you liked this list, you're in luck. We've got loads of RPG recommendations for you here on Dicebreaker, including ones that you can play solo, without a GM, horror-themed games, you name it. So please do like and subscribe and click the bell icon to see more of us here on YouTube, not to mention the huge amount of recommendations and reviews and all sorts that you can find on dicebreaker.com. Check out the links popping up on screen and in the description below for more info. But until then, I'll see you on the next one and have a lovely day.